Hey there, um, it's Greg Braille from Sonoa Systems. I'm in our offices in California, and this is actually, I think, the fourth video we've done. It's starting to feel like a lot of videos today, so we're gonna take a break after this. Um, we're talking about APIs, web services APIs on the internet, and right now we're gonna talk about traffic management. Um, anyone who's doing an API for real has at least thought about traffic management. Um, maybe, you know, you work for Google, and you have an infinite variety of, of servers, and all you have to do is push a button and a million servers come up. So maybe you don't have to worry about this, but even if you work at Google, you should, because it costs a lot of money to run all those servers. Um, but if you don't work for Google, you probably have to think about how many servers you have to run your API on, whether they can really handle the load. And if you're putting them on the internet, well, you have no idea what the load's gonna be. Um, and in any, anyone who's run a real website knows this in spades, and I don't need to tell them, but if you're new to an API, it applies to your API world. Fortunately, one difference between an API and a website is that people are used to the idea of rate limits and quotas and the idea that you're going to be monitoring what they do. So if you've used the Twitter API, you know that it only accepts 100 requests an hour per username. You probably don't know that there's also a rate limit on your IP address just to make sure you don't do anything crazy. If you've used some of the APIs from Yahoo or Google or LinkedIn, you've seen the similar things and maybe you've even accepted a set of terms of service that says um, how many requests you're going to make and what they're going to do if you make too many. They do this to keep you from blowing up their backend infrastructure. They also do this to make sure that one user doesn't screw up the response time of everyone else. They also do it because the data their API returns might be important to them. Um, if you could download Twitter, if you had enough disk space, you might be able to do something really cool with that. And if I work for Twitter, I'm not sure I'd want you to be able to do that. Um, so I'm not sure I want to pay for you to do that either. Maybe if you call me up and give me some money, I'll let you download Twitter. So this is where all these things come in. So at Sonoa, we've come up with some terminology that we use um, that I think makes this make a whole lot of sense. We talk about rate limits and quotas. Really, for a lot of people, it's all about rate limiting. A rate limit is simply keep track of how, how much each user is using my API and stop them when they use it too much. Um, almost every API needs some sort of a rate limit. For instance, if nothing else, you know, put on a rate limit by IP address and say, you know, no more than a thousand requests a second by IP address. That at least pretend, prevents you from, you know, total emergency. Maybe someone decides that, you know, today's the day to run a performance test on your API and see how fast they can call it. Or maybe someone accidentally writes a program to call your API and, you know, oops, it accidentally has an infinite loop in it. I've, I've never done that. Or maybe someone accidentally decides that, uh, or maliciously decides that today's the day to try and download all of your data. So by having some basic rate limit there, that's a good idea. Now when we talk about rate limits at Sonoa, it's usually something that's expressed per second. And it's usually something that is more of an average over time. You know, if you send 1,000 requests one second and 950 the next, it's kind of about the same. We distinguish quotas from rate limits. And quotas have more to do with an SLA. For instance, 100 requests per username per hour, or 10,000 requests per API key per day, or 100 requests per hour, but if you call us up and pay 10 bucks a month, you can have 1,000 requests an hour or 10,000 requests an hour. That's a quota. If you send 101 requests to Twitter in one minute, you have to wait an hour to send number 102. Or actually, 101 because 101 will fail. So that's an example of a quota. It's all part of traffic management and rate limiting. But usually when you're working on an API, it's important to distinguish between those because traffic management and rate, oh, sorry, rate limits are really more about controlling bursts of traffic, whereas quotas are more about making sure people follow the SLA that they signed when they signed up for your API. You may choose that you don't actually want to enforce a quota or a rate limit. You may simply want to monitor. And you may say, and this is up to you, my rate limit is 10,000 requests a day, but if somebody goes over I'm just kind of, kind of watching my logs. I'm going to have my operators be alerted, and I might give them a call or send them an email. Or I might shut off their API key if they're abusing the system. Or you might say, my quota is 100 requests an hour, and when you get to 101, you're done. You have to wait until the hour is up. It's up to you. It depends on your business. Maybe your business model is you just want to protect your back end from blowing up, in which case these can be very flexible. Maybe your business model is such that you want people to pay for your API, in which case they have to be very strict. 
So these are the issues that we talk about all the time with customers building APIs. And it's really become very repeatable. People come to us now and say, I'm building an API and I'm not sure how to do rate limits and quotas. And it's, it's, it's something that is becoming a real standard in the API world. And, and we think it's, it's very important and it's a really good thing and uh, we're happy to help with it. And that's it for the videos for now. We're going to take a break and I'm sure we'll have more soon.